to the back of the church, please. Bell ringer to the back of the church. <laughs> You have a cell phone. Would you turn your cell phone off or turn it to vibrate so that it doesn't um, ring in our worship service? The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 135, verse 3. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to the Lord's name, for the Lord is gracious. Please stand as you're able. We're going to sing the first five verses of O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. O for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise the glories of my God and King the triumphs of His grace my gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, his music in the sinners is his life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the phallus clean, his blood avails for me. He speaks and listening to his voice, to life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Would you welcome to Central United Methodist Church? Please welcome one another just by waving. If you're watching us by video today, please welcome you as well. You may be seated. Let us pray. God of grace, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you that we have this warm place to worship. We pray that you would be with us today. Warm our hearts as you did John Wesley and help us to know that your presence is here with us and assist us as we worship you to see you in every aspect of the hymns and the prayers and the scriptures and the word proclaimed. For this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our responsive reading this morning is from Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. I'll do the part of the light print and leave you through the dark. The Lord is my chosen portion the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly carriage. I have 
shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Small bag or big bag? Big bag. The big bag. Okay. All right. There's something in here that has the bag filled today, but it's heavy. Uh, And it has a uh, Hebrew on it, actually, at, at the bottom of it. Uh, among other things, I don't read Hebrew. I can read translations in Hebrew, but it, especially if they're in the English. And then it says Roma on it. Um, my kids when they competed in, in baseball or, or what's the one where you set it up on the stand and you get team ball or, you know, in things like that, every kid got a trophy. Whether you were in first place or you were in dead last, you got a trophy. Um, when I was a kid, that wasn't so, right? That wasn't first, second, third place. You got a trophy. If um, if you didn't place at least third, you were just out of the medal. So right, we all know what it means to be out of the medal. Now Paul talks about a prize too, and um, much more. When I was a kid, you had to keep your eye out for the prize, right? You had to keep moving forward to look for that prize. I think my kids knew I'm going to get a trophy no matter how I perform. In the end, I'm going to get the I participated trophy. Um, but we, we, I think, we have to keep our eyes out for the prize. You know, and Paul tells us that we need to, right? Well, not on the sparrow, that's what God does, but we have to keep our eyes looking forward in the race so to speak, that we have to keep our eyes forward, looking for the finish of our faith. And of course, the prize was eternal life, right? being resurrected and, and living eternally with, with Jesus. Um, I don't know if trophies were necessarily good or bad. Um, I know that in my kid's generation, at least, the idea was we don't want to leave the kids feeling like they lost, definitely. That there was something to do with self-esteem. Um, I do like the idea of what Paul says about looking at them and running the race, looking forward. Um, because there's really nothing you can do about your past, right? And you can't run backwards. Um, and and say, Ooh, you know, I said that, that awful word to Brigitte two weeks ago, so I'm just going to run backwards until I catch yesterday and apologize to Brigitte, and then we'll both go forward and be happy together. It doesn't work that way. So I like the idea of moving forward. And maybe it's what we do while we are moving forward that, that is prize-worthy, so to speak. 
that is the prophet. When the next time I don't say something to Brigitte that upsets her or that is mean or, or whatever, maybe that's one of the prices of the race. That I've become a better person and that she's been affirmed. Maybe one of the prizes of the race is, is when I reach out and, you know, Jesus says, if someone takes your, 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 uh, uh, your cloak, give me your coat also. So maybe when I do that, in generosity, maybe that's one of the prizes of living this life. Um, and then maybe the prize, when, I, when I've strung all those trophies of good Christian living together, so to speak, living my faith together, Maybe then that the best prize is to hear Jesus say, well done, God, a good and faithful servant. Maybe that's, maybe that's the prize to be heard above, above every other prize. So um, we can't look back. We can only look forward. Paul says it's a race, and no one races with by looking back. We go toward the finish line, but looking toward the finish line, the finish of our faith. But I think there are jewels, there are prizes, there are things that we can, we can experience all along the way as we live out our faith. Um, and maybe, maybe that in prize is God affirming that we, that we live according to God's word. So, um, you don't need to put one of these on my casket someday. I don't care. I can't take any trophies with me, right? <coughs> but um, I hope that we will always be able to affirm the goodness and the tribes that we have in each other. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm just going to throw this down like I do so many of your other... Uh, I'll put it right there, okay? All right. Um, I have to look page, so I don't know what else it is. I don't think of it. One of the things of this cheap paper we're using to make copies with is it's hard for my fingers to put it. Okay, we're going to sing now. Come thou font of every blessing. <laughs> Soon all those around can warm a 
keeping its flowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread the love to everyone. You want to pass it on. The wondrous time is spring when all the trees are budding. The birds begin to sing. The flowers start their blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to sing. It's fresh like spring. You want to pass it on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. You can depend on God. It matters not where you're bound. I'll shout it from the mountain top. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to be. I want to pass it on. Yeah. 
the master whispers down eternity, and heroic spirits answer now as then in Galilee. Lord, we are able, our spirits are thine. Remold and make us like thee. Downstairs is an old house trap, which don't read code anymore, but they did a hundred years ago when they poured the basement floor. And the thing is, it's been clogging up more and more and more, giving us more and more grief. And we're about to have that house trap dug out and circumvented. And so I, I'm just thrilled that my best friend in the basement won't be a snake anymore. Um, and so we rejoice in that. And then I rejoice in a donation that we got yesterday. Semi-truck pulled up in front of the church yesterday, and Richard was by himself when it pulled up. He knew it was coming, but he thought he was the only one to help unload it. And people came out of the woodwork to unload that truck. We had a nice crew by the time it was done. What was on that truck, there were two pallets of Hostess cakes, of various sorts, including um, just ambrosia in the bag. They had a strawberry, uh, strawberry donuts dipped in chocolate, which uh, uh, Wilma and I hit pretty hard. Um, but we had two pallets of those. We also got in um, pallets of hand, the pump hand soap. We got in pallets with paper towels on it. We got in pallets with antiseptic cleaner on it. Um, and we got in a box of candles, but there was a lot of glass broken in the candles, and I'm not sure if they'll be able to salvage any of those. 
but we're, we're working on that. So just a donation that someone called up and said, hey, you want it? And one of Pastor Gary's cardinal roles has never turned down a donation. And so um, I didn't, and Richard at first went, oh, no. <laughs> but uh, the help showed up to unload it, and we're so grateful for that as well. So you're always going to have soap in the bathrooms and roll of paper towels for a long, long time. For a long, long time. <laughs> and the donuts, uh, well, there's none left. <laughs> no, Will, Will and I, Don't mind me. Will and I <laughs> ate two pallets of Hostess cake yesterday. No, they're, they're downstairs. We, we would... We don't want to open them today because we're not prepared to hand them out in a controlled way yet. We want to be able to control the way they go out of here. So, yeah, next week we'll we'll have some upstairs in the sanctuary. All right. Okay. <laughs> Any concerns this morning? Um. those who are out in the cold this day. Um, today and tomorrow are just going to be really brutal days.
gathered together to praise, to worship, to bring forward in our community our joys and our concerns. You know all of these without us even speaking them, but we bring them together, we speak them aloud so that we can share and pray to you.
that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The epistle reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 24. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. <coughs> Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Will you stand as you are able for the gospel reading this morning? It comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Of life 
and Generation X. Now I will say I knew the answer to this question because this is a favorite movie of mine. Not because I was part of the skater culture then or now, but rather because the meaning is relatable to all types of people from my generation and from others as well. You see, at its most essential, the phrase gleaming the cube means finding the edge of your limits and challenging yourself. Finding the edge of your limits and challenging yourself in that place. And that is basically what several people offered us the meaning, what others admitted they didn't really know what it meant. And a good conversation thread was generated over the course of several days. As I followed and participated in the conversation, I thought about how that idea might make a good sermon. And so I kept it in the back burner, <clears throat> allowed it to simmer for a few days while I waited for inspiration. Our scripture for today is Micah 6, 1 through 8, a very well-known set of verses, especially <clears throat> verse 8. Many people have quoted this scripture throughout the generations to support the fight for justice and ending oppression and marginalization of people within society. Specifically, verse 8. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Whenever this verse from Micah comes up, I think of a former bishop from the former Kansas East Conference, Bishop Fritz Moody. I heard him preach several times from this scripture over the years as he would share that it has always been the inspiration and motivation for his ministry, his whole career in ministry, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. Of all the virtues that exist, of all the ways that people can be told to behave, of all the habits that might guide our thoughts and our actions, these three are the ones that the prophet Micah tells us are shown to us and required of us by God. As Jesus made his way through the countryside, he was headed for that final triumphal return to Jerusalem. It would begin with shouts of loud hosanna and praise and would turn into a long, brutal march to Golgotha and death on a cross. And it would end with resurrection and life. People asked him questions along the way and he taught them through parables, stories, how to act justly, how to love mercy, and how to walk humbly with God. One of these people that he came across during his ministry asked him, Lord, what is the greatest commandment? He wanted Jesus to take the bullet points and sum it up in one easy PowerPoint slide that would give him an easy way to fulfill everything in the Law and the Prophets so that he could find the most direct and easiest route to salvation. Jesus answered this man's question without judgment or condemnation toward his desire to find an easy way. He summed up all the teaching in the Law and the Prophets and distilled the basic requirement for a follower of God down to two things. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as 
as yourself. It isn't exactly a recipe for easy salvation, though, is it? We still have to put some work into it. We have to spend time with God so that He can show us what is good. So He can show us what is required of each of us. So we can find out for ourselves how to do these things. What specific thoughts and behaviors, what habits and disciplines both lead to and flow from living this way. To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. If we do those things, we will love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we will love our neighbor. And we will love ourselves. Even though these things fit together in the puzzle of who God wants us to be, they aren't really specific directives either. What does it really mean? to act justly, to love mercy, to walk on. Maybe if we go back to my thoughts at the beginning about the movie Gleaming the Cube and what that phrase means as a guide for behavior. Finding the edge of your limits and challenging yourself in that place. In order to be the people God wants us to be, we have to have the strength of our convictions, and our convictions need to be based on our faith in God and the belief that we want to be the kind of person that God wants us to be. It's very easy to act unjustly. It's very easy to love it's very easy to be filled with pride and ignore a relationship with God. I think it's probably easier to see what these opposite ways of being look like as thoughts and habits. But that's not what we're going to focus on. If we are going to be who God wants us to be, if we are going to love God and love our neighbor, if we are going to do this by acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly, we are going to have to find the edge of our limits and challenge ourselves in that place. To do this, each one of us has to find and face the intersections where we benefit from oppressive systems and where we are oppressed within those systems. And then open our hearts to the intersection of others, some of whom have more oppressive intersections, and some of whom have fewer. Those are the people who benefit the most from the oppressive and generous systems that show no mercy, are filled with pride rather than and our absence in the kingdom of God. I think the common idea we all have of justice within oppressive systems is that of fairness. Good people get good things. Bad people get punished for being bad. That's justice. The problem with this idea is that it's not how God sees justice. Justice for God is more than punity, more than punishment, more than fairness. For with injustice is mercy. And that's why it comes next for my God. I think the common idea we all have of mercy is that it allows people to get away with their bad behavior. It's a weakness. It's being unwilling or not strong enough to punish a person for what they've done wrong. Can you see what kinds of things are missing from these common 
ideas we have about justice and mercy? One of the things is forgiveness. Another is repentance. Both of which can lead to reconciliation and restoration. God's idea of justice is when society is ordered in a way that does not oppress or marginalize anyone. God's idea of mercy is giving people a chance to change and do better. To walk humbly with God is to find the courage to promote God's definition of justice and mercy. To work for a society that does not oppress or marginalize anyone. To stop thinking in terms of punishing people and let God be in charge of what happens in their hearts and lives. To create space for forgiveness and change, even if you can't stay with the person in that space. I'm definitely not advocating staying with someone who's abusive to give them another chance. When we walk humbly with God, we can remove ourselves from unsafe situations and allow others to help us be safe, while we also surrender the outcome and allow God to handle the other person's part and behavior in the future. We can pray for that person that God will help them change and that no one else will be hurt by them. In doing so, we find the edge of our legs and challenge ourselves in that place because being this way is not easy. And in doing so, we can find the way to love God with all of our heart mind and strength, and we can love our neighbor as ourselves, and we can do justly, we can love mercy, and we will then walk humbly with our God.
Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The sunflower there is in honor of Kansas Day. We're 162 years old today. So you may be seated. The uh, echo cable that may be doing up there. Um, here you go. Coffee Fellowship meets at 9 o'clock at Manor Hall. We hope you'll come join us on Sundays. Um, the Good Neighbor Experience is resumed in our church, and we just did lesson one on relationships there. Uh, and just as an experiment, if you want to know in your own neighborhood how you're doing at being a good neighbor, draw a box, put your your house in the middle of that box and then name the eight neighbors closest to you and ask yourself, do I know them or do I just know their name? What do I know about them or do I not know them? Um, are, you, are they to, uh, acquaintance? Are you in a real relationship with them or are, are you strangers with them? Uh, so just try that little experiment. What we're doing with the Good Neighbor Experiment is we're drawing that box, we're calling it Arborville, and we're looking at the church as an individual and saying, what kind of neighbor are we as a church in the neighborhood Arborville? And I can almost name all eight people all around us here. And we have pretty good uh, contact with, with them. So, okay, the Administrative Council will be on February 12th at uh, 9.15 a.m. and our vice chairperson Kim over here is going to be running this meeting for the very first time and since it's so close to Valentine's Day she wants to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with all of you. Uh, so you want to attend the administrative council meeting. That's right. And our Ash Wednesday service will be on February 22nd at 6 p.m. And we hope that you'll prepare and join us for that. We have the ashes already, and we have the chalice all ready to go. And then, so Ash Wednesday, February the 22nd at 6 p.m. If you go downstairs, we have uh, we have children who are meeting here on the second, fourth Wednesday of every month, and they made Valentines for us uh, for our church uh, this this past Wednesday. If you go downstairs, there's 20 count, 37 or 40 or something like that. If you go downstairs, make sure you see all of these Valentines that they take in our basement and in our, in our dining hall. Uh, those are Valentines from them to you, uh, the people of this church. So if you normally go out these doors, maybe go down the stairs and go out the basement doors so that you get a chance to see the Valentines that our children's program uh, made just for you. Okay, uh, birthdays and anniversaries. It's Kansas' birthday. It's 162 years old. Jan has a birthday, and she's not here, uh, so we're going to sing it to her when she comes next week. All right, but we can sing Happy Birthday to Kansas. I think we I'm, I'm happy to be in Kansas. Uh, I hope you are, even though I'm from Wisconsin, eh? Uh, even though I'm from Wisconsin, I'm glad to be a Kansan. So, let us sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Now may the God of grace and joy and love go with you from this place by the presence of God's Holy Spirit working in your lives. May you always be strengthened to live the call that God places upon you and to bring the realm of God 
to every neighbor that you meet this week. Go forth and make it a terrific week. Amen.